All right, first of all, I'm sorry about problem two of the homework. I hadn't real, I didn't, I hadn't, I just sort of imagined how to do it and hadn't actually done the interviews myself. It, is, it was messier than, than I'd like homework problems to be. On the other hand, I suppose if you use mathematics, it wasn't too bad. Um, one lesson from that problem is that um, although in the case of a free particle, we got the exact answer just by doing n equals 3 or even n equals 2 and then extrapolating. For this case, um, the, uh, the order epsilon corrections or order epsilon squared corrections in the in factorizing um, writing e to the minus i uh, p squared over 2m plus a half m omega squared q squared in, uh, times epsilon. In writing this as e to the minus i epsilon p squared over 2m e to the minus i epsilon from half m squared omega squared squared. This approximation is um, in the limit of small epsilon. It's good to order epsilon, but not to order epsilon squared and so forth. We probably could have gotten a better approximation if we had written it as uh, e to the minus i epsilon over 4 m squared omega squared q squared this might, but um, so this this would have worked out a little better, but it would have been right, perhaps even messier to do the to do the integrations. Um, in any event, the whole idea is that what we're doing is we're summing over all the limit of, uh, of um, all functions like that and the limit epsilon going to zero. And um, uh, in that limit, the thing is um, exact. I mean, we get the right answer. And of course, the final trick gives you the right answer. Now, um, first of all, are there any questions? All right, I'm going to um, actually repeat some of what I went through on Monday because um, I thought of a simple way of doing it, which also will illustrate some more of the, the physics and the mathematics. And I put these new notes online this afternoon. Oh, the new website, let us see. Now, unfortunately, I didn't bring anything with me. But I think now what it is is bio.phys.unm.edu slash, I think it's slash 523-12 slash index HTML. I think I think it's that way. It's simpler than it was before. Little tarp. Excuse me? Little tarp. Just to five, two, three. So I can drop the HTML stuff? Just that? Uh, no, no tarp. I mean, just to to uh, five two three then slash index dot oh, no twelve yeah. no dash twelve yeah no dash twelve no yeah. yeah even better put I, back I did put a but then put back the index slash yeah. index yeah. dot shit <laughs> <laughs> but it works if it was just this one so I really have to do that
let's just review. Let's see, thanks for the help. I give you a chocolate. And also, the person who's moving the camera gets a chocolate. Thanks. All right. So, we've, um, we were talking about the, the theory of a free scale of field. And And we computed this last time, namely that it was uh, e to the one half integral j of x delta of x minus x prime j of x prime d four of x d four of x prime, where delta of x minus x prime is the Euclidean version of the Feynman propagator. And of course, p squared here we're in Euclidean space, so it's, it's just this, it's, there are no minus signs. That's one of the nice things about Euclidean space, no minus signs. And Things are exponentially damped. Everything's simpler. Okay, so last time we went into momentum space directly at this point and showed that um, a current that consisted of two particles, one at x1 and another one at x2, for all time, two stationary delta functions, that that uh, produced negative energy, and we interpreted that as saying that scalar, part of, scalar fields uh, uh, produce attractive forces. Um, what I want to do now is instead um, s you stay in space-time and um, use the same current, J of x is delta of x minus x1, plus delta of x minus x2, and I'm going to call that j1 of x plus j2 of x. So these are going to be the same. I'm going to redo the same calculation, and I hope um, that this will make things clearer, and um, it'll just be good to see things from a different point of view. Um, there's always a danger that one can go too fast. And this, the problem is that even with chocolate incentives, students don't probably ask enough questions. <coughs> so um, repeating things is probably a good idea. So um, substituting in here, we're going to get a 1-1 one, one term, a 2-2 two, two term, a 1-2 one, two term, and a 2-1 two, term. The 1-1 one, one and 2-2 two, two terms are both infinite, and they're due to the um, use of delta functions as currents. So we're going to ignore them, and we're just going to look at the 1, 2. The 2, 1 is the same as the 1, 2. And so let's just look then at the <coughs> integral j1 of x delta of x minus x prime j2 of x prime d4 of x d4 of x prime. Okay, well, this is very simple in some ways. This is just delta of x minus x1 delta of x prime minus x2 J2 of x prime is delta x prime minus x2 and so forth. And I've left out the one half. Um, so what does this give us? Well, the integration, these are three-dimensional delta functions. And so the integration over the spatial parts 
goes away, and we have an integral delta of x1 minus, let me see how I wrote this, x1 minus x2 dx10 dx20. In other words, in here, the spatial part of x is x1. The spatial part of x prime is x2. But the time part of x prime is arbitrary and we're integrating over it and the time part of x of the x is I'm calling that x10 and we're integrating over that and um, so that's uh, that's what we have now let's let's look at what this is we'll use now the Fourier representation of this um, Euclidean space finally propagated d fourth t two pi to the fourth, and now we have dx one zero, dx two zero. So first of all, let's let's do the dx. Let's see which one did I do? Yeah, let's do the dx one zero. So this may clear up some of this business about time, all time being delta of zero over two pi and so forth. So the integration e to the i p0 x0 over 2 pi dx10. So I'm just focusing on x10 only occurs here. We have this dx10. Well, this is just, let me go this way, delta of p0. Okay. You guys have seen this formula a lot, I hope. Okay. All right. So, so what we have here then is, uh, let me in fact add an extra step. We've got the. Um, We have delta of p0, then we have d fourth p over 2 pi uh, cubed. We have delta of p0, and we have dx20. So one of these two pi is dx10, and we have something else there. So this is this is three-dimensional, but we have another term which I left out. This doesn't seem to be any quite any way to put it. So let me just say we also have e to the minus i p zero x two zero. Literally. But this delta function and the d4, when we do the dp0 integration, that sets p0 equal to 0. This thing just turns into e to the 0, which is 1. And so we're left with integral e to the i p x1 minus x2, just the spatial part. This p squared only has momentum components now, so space components. We're left with dqp over 2 pi q. This has gone away, and now we have dx0. Okay. Well, this three-dimensional integral we did in class last time, and it's 1 over 4 pi x1 minus x2 uh, times e to the minus m x1 minus x2. And what do we have left? Well, we have this crazy integral x20 from minus infinity plus infinity. This is the t that I was talking about. So by doing it in space time, first of all, the calculation is simpler. And secondly, we get directly this t integration. And the reason why this 
Um, well, let, let's, let's now make the make contact with what this um, what this z zero of j is. Um, we're thinking of it as uh, I mean another way of writing it is integral e to the integral j of x p of x t fourth x but then e to the minus integral the energy d fourth x all at d v divided by integral e to the minus h of v d fourth x d v and so what we're thinking of all this is is it's the basically the energy in other words it's something like e to the minus e of r and j times the integral dx to zero. That's, that's the way I'm thinking of it. Um, in other words, the thinking of these in other words it's the it's the change in the energy due to this term here and so let's so that gives us this um, attractive force. Um, now, other questions? Where did the dx10 go? Dx10. Ah, good question. Where are the other oh, chalk? What was the. It, 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 yeah, it gave us the delta function. It was over here. Dx10, dvi p0x0 for 2 pi gave us the delta of p0. And that delta of p0 then came here. What's the other delta of p0 from? Oh Christ! I have two of them. That was a mistake. So I have room then for this factor. Sorry, I. So who asked the second question? Where did the second one come from? Um, I must say, I the the relation of this I mean, this side of the board getting us to this. I must admit it's a, it's what one calls hand waving. Um, I let me think. I, 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 maybe on Monday I'll fill that in. It's it's when I was working this out, I thought of that as being sort of obvious and of course that's the point of view Z takes also but um, it's not quite fun. it's not it'd be nice to have to fill that in a little more clearly um, anyway now let's let's go back to this formula namely that 
the mean value in the vacuum. This is the vacuum of this theory, and the theory we're talking about is this free field theory. That's why we're able to get the actual answer. So Z0 of J is the mean, is the vacuum of the free theory, the ground state is a free theory, e to the JV time order, Euclidean time order, is this particular integral. Well, this, this allows us now to compute what the mean values of fields are, what time order products of fields are in this theory. Of course, this is a soluble theory, which is why we're able to compute them at all exactly. So let me do that. And I'm going to do it um, in, in sort of physics style first, and then I'm going to uh, show you something about the mathematics that's behind it. So what we've got here is z0 of j is time order product e to the integral of jv e4 of x, which is also e to the one half integral j of x, j of x prime, delta of x prime, delta of x prime, e4 of x, e4 of x prime. Okay, so that's a nice formula, and it's sort of magical. We can do it. We have such a nice formula because it's a, it's a soluble theory. Now, we can differentiate with respect to j of x. Now, this is called a functional derivative. And I'm going to do it two different ways. I'm going to first say, let's, um, let's just imagine that uh, space-time, instead of being continuous, is a bunch of hypercubes. And so that this is actually a sum, and we're going to just differentiate with respect to the j of each uh, hypercube. So then we would have dz0 dj of, say, x1. Uh, what would that be? Well, over here, it would be time ordered product v of x1 e to the n j of x, v of x, v4 of x, and all of this is time ordered. And then on the right hand side, what we're differentiating that, we would get uh, integral delta of x1 minus x prime, j of x prime, d4 x prime times e to the one half integral. Let me just write it as jj prime delta d4 x d4 x prime. Okay, so we've now you, you might say where did the one half go? Well you can differentiate the jx can be x1 or x prime can be x1. So we get two contributions here. Okay. Now we can differentiate again with respect to, say, dj of x1, dj of x2. And now what will we get? Well, we're going to get here uh, another term. So we will have time order product p of x1, p of x2, e to the integral j of x, p of x, p of x, time order product. And now on the right, we can get two terms. If we differentiate down here, 
then we'll simply have delta of x1 minus x prime times this thing, which is z0 of j. And then the other term, we have to differentiate up here. And so we get this thing squared. So we get plus integral, well, not really squared. It would be integral delta x1 minus x prime j of x prime. No, it actually is, no, it's not. It's integral delta x, um, I would say x minus x2 j of x d4 of x, and then that times z0 of j. So that's what we would get. But this is kind of messy. And it vastly simplifies if we now take the limit of both sides for the case j equals 0. Yeah? Um, so when we write out the second derivative of z0 with respect to the case, um, would that, um, that delta the um, here, uh, cap, uh, so here, cap and go right, uh, as we write it out as a sum of different terms, um, wouldn't that be x1 minus x2 instead of minus x prime? Because isn't x prime just like a um, oh. variable? Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in other words, this one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, right. Absolutely, it's um, x2. Okay. That's uh, really important that you pointed that out. Yeah, because we're differentiating with respect to uh, j of x2, so that means we have an x2 here. Okay, now, if we let j go to 0, remember that z0 of 0 is just 1. And if we set j equal to 0, then this term goes away. This term becomes 1. And these terms just vanish. This becomes 1, and each of these terms is 0. So the answer that we get is delta x minus x prime. 
and by that I mean m squared minus d2 a squared or of this or to write it more explicitly minus some i equals zero to three partial to partial x i squared of delta of x minus x prime. Well, when that hits this, that is m minus, there is this, let me just write this as, I'm going to write this as i. E i squared, because it's a repeated index, we sum over it from 0 to 3 here. And what is this? Well, this is this integral, e to the i p x minus x prime equal to p to pi to the fourth p squared plus m squared. Well, the second derivative just pulls down an i p. So in other words, this gives us integral m squared minus pi squared sum pi p actually there's there are two minus signs so it's plus x minus x prime d fourth p over two pi to four now we have p squared plus m squared so this is just p squared so these cancel, and this is just equal to so this is just equal to integral e to the i p x minus x prime p fourth p over two pi to the fourth, which is to say delta of x minus x prime, and if you want, you can put a 4 there to indicate that it's a four-dimensional delta function. So, this thing that is the Euclidean two-point function is also the Green's function for this operator, m squared minus box. By the way, this box notation is something of a mathematical joke because people write the Laplacian as divergence of gradient, okay? And so this is sum i equals one to three of di squared. So that's a triangle, so you just make it a box, and then this is sum i equals, say, zero to three di squared, so you have four derivatives. Now, in, in Minkowski space, one also uses box, and then it's either d by dt squared minus grad squared, or it's grad squared minus d by dt squared, depending on what notation, uh, whether the damn minus sign that creeps into, that we have in uh, special law too. Yeah. Just to check on not missing something, that those m should be squared, is that right? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, that m should be squared. Yes. Again, my left arm was probably down. My left hand was down when I wrote that. Okay. Okay. So that is that. Um, That's done. So I guess now the thing to talk about is um, something about functional derivatives. So I'm going to describe, I, I put this chapter online actually a week or two ago. I don't know if anybody looked at it, but um, this would be, this is a, um, a mathematical discussion of functional derivatives. Over here, I was saying, well, imagine space-time would be made up of these hypercubes and we differentiate with respect to each one, so 
these are just ordinary partial derivatives. I should have written it, I guess, as a partial derivative. In fact, all of those should have been partial derivatives. But still, it's, it's worthwhile to do things correctly. So let me, let me show you how to understand this uh, correctly. And it's, it's worth knowing what the mathematics is behind it, because the mathematics is very simple. And because once you understand what the simple mathematics is, then you, in principle, know how to do any of these uh, functional derivatives. All right. So um, let me just follow my notes here uh, directly. Um, a functional derivative is actually a functional of a functional. So let's suppose that g, in fact, let me say, suppose g of f is some functional, in which case it might be integral. Let's stay in one dimension to make things simpler. It might be fn of x integrated. So that's a function. Now, the functional derivative mathematicians think of it this way, as a functional or a functional, sort of a double functional. And it's d by d epsilon of the functional g of the function f plus epsilon h. So f and h are functions, epsilon's a number, and then we're doing this at epsilon equal to zero. So it's a it's a it's a double functional. In other words, g of f h is just in this particular case, it's an integral dx f of x plus h of x to the n. Well. That's what we get at this point. 
Now, so that's a, a functional derivative. But in physics, what we do is what we do is we don't use arbitrary functions h of x. We in fact use delta functions. So in other words, we would use this notation. We would say the variational derivative of g of x with respect to, say, f of y is this in this notation that I've been using so far. It's f. And the second function, h, is delta of x minus y. So instead of h being arbitrary, we let that be delta of x minus y. And then using this formula, we would have n integral f of x to the n minus 1 delta of x minus y dx. And so that just gives us n f n minus 1 y. So that's the answer. Yeah. So is this, I mean, is this like, I don't know, just trying to get my head around this, is this kind of analogous how like, to how you can take directional derivatives in like a finite dimensional space? And then it's like f is like the base point and h is the direction here in the derivative? That, that might be, I, 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 I haven't quite understood what you, Say that might, I mean, if it helps you, maybe that's a good way of thinking of it. Because, um, I mean, it just seems like that definition there, taking the derivative you know, with respect to like a parameter and then evaluate it at zero, like that's what you do with directional derivatives. Uh, like it's just a regular function, but it seems like it's just a functional, or like function space instead. All right. I, why don't we talk about it after class? Maybe yeah. it may take me five minutes to understand what you're saying. And yeah. Then, yeah. At some point, then we can get it straight. I don't know if. All right. Anyway, I I'm not sure the notation I'm using is is absolutely the simplest or best. In fact, I don't think it is. But I hope I've made it clear what we're doing, and now I'm going to do some more examples, and I think I think things will get clearer as I do more examples. So let's now consider uh, something that's more subtle, um, namely suppose the functional involves derivatives, and in fact the functionals that we use in physics typically do. And so in this case, this business of just doing hypercubes the way I was uh, doing in the case of um, deriving the two-point formula, that wouldn't really work. So let us uh, say that g of f in this case is an integral dx f prime of x squared. So now to do the variational derivative. And um, most of what I'm, you know, I, I may make a few extra remarks on the board, but basically I'm following these notes that are online, so you don't have to write down everything by any means. So this is d by the epsilon of g of f plus epsilon h. Again, epsilon is and so this is d by d epsilon dx f prime of x plus epsilon h of x prime squared epsilon equals zero. And now, what is this going to be? Well, if we do by the d by d epsilon, you see this is simply going to be an integral dx 2f prime of x h prime of x because the f prime squared term doesn't have an epsilon and the epsilon squared h prime squared term 
vanish between epsilon and zero. And so we get that as the answer. And so now we would say the variational, the physics type variational derivative. This is then uh, using that notation over there, g of f and now delta of x minus y. And so now we would have this formula, dx 2 f prime of x. Oh, um, suppose we integrate by parts. Then we get um, dx minus 2 f prime of x double prime h of x. Or we could leave it as the delta function. Then we have delta prime. In fact, it's in a sense better to leave it as the delta function because then we have the derivative of the delta function. Let me just mention something about delta functions. One of the nice things about delta functions is that obviously you drop all the surface terms because the delta function is non-zero at a particular point essentially. And so the, the, the terms at infinity or at the limits um, always vanish. And in fact, mathemat when mathematicians uh, talk about delta functions, they define them so that integration by parts is always done without any surface term. Uh, so this thing, now integrating by parts, is uh, integral dx um, minus 2 f double prime of x delta of x minus y, and that's equal to minus 2 f double prime of y. So that's, um, that's what this variational derivative in this case is, namely variation g, variation uh, uh, f of y is minus 2 f double prime of y. Okay.
trying to explain. In fact, let's go to your observation, namely let's think about a particular action. Let's say that S is, and just to make sure I have all the factors right, an integral dt, m over 2, uh, dq of t, dt squared. And we're going from t1 to t2, say. Okay, so this is an action functional. It's, in fact, what we've been taught. It's, it's a, the simplest example of what Um, it's a simple example of what we've been dealing with. Um, and the more complicated one, so let's call this S0 and S of Q would be integral T1 to T2 dt. And let me just write this now as M over 2. We got squared minus D of Q. So this is sort of a general one-dimensional action. This is the free one-dimensional action. So let's go with the free one this time. And let's consider the variational derivative in general. I left off the uh, the subtrip zero in the notes, but that's okay. I hope I have the right one. Oh no. Interesting. I wasn't doing. Okay, so I'm actually doing the notes right. I'm actually doing this one. So it's d by d epsilon integral dt m over two q dot plus epsilon h dot squared minus v of q of t plus epsilon h of t. This is the variational derivative. And well, we can we've had enough experience that we know we just look at the uh, at the linear term and cancel the epsilon. And so this in fact is simply integral dt m q dot h dot minus v prime. Well, this is a little bit more subtle. Do a Taylor series expansion of V, keep the first term. Well, you can keep all the terms, but once you differentiate and then set epsilon to zero, it's only the first term that matters. So it's V prime of Q times um, H of T. So this is what we get. And um, writing it a little bit in a slightly nicer fashion. Well, I integrated by parts. <clears throat> but in fact, if we, if we instead go directly to the physics notation, then putting in a delta function allows us to integrate by parts without saying that. So either we can say that h vanishes at t1 and t2, or we can say, um, that we go to the delta function limit. And in that case, we have the variational derivative of s of q with respect to q of t prime. Well, this will be this. This will be uh, the notation I've been using, delta of t minus t prime. And so this thing then is integral dt m q dot delta dot of t minus t prime minus v prime delta t minus t prime. And now we can integrate the delta function by parts. We get a double dot here and a minus sign. And now the delta function projects out just minus m q double dot minus v prime. So that's our answer. 
namely the variation derivative of S Q with respect to Q or T prime is minus M Q double dot of T prime minus V prime of Q of T prime. Okay? I see some frowns on some faces. Is that because I forgot to give you a trombone? <laughs> By the way, we're getting up to story time. Um, so let me show you what's kind of interesting at this point. Namely that you get the classical equation of motion as simply the variation of derivative. Variational derivative of the action is the class gives you the classical equation of motion, which is Lagrange's equation. Oh, I should say, if you set the variational derivative equal to zero, duh, if you set the variational derivative equal to zero, then you get the classical equation of motion, which is then that's equal to zero, then you have m q double dot in minus prime. That's the equation for this simple. Okay, um, um, so I, maybe this is a story to a question. All right, I'll um, tell a couple of Feynman stories. Um, I did not really know Feynman because I was never really at Caltech, but I did visit Caltech at a conference. And one of the really nice things, very intelligent things that the Caltech people did was they had something happening every night during the conference. And they, they were smart enough to realize that when people go to a conference, they um, typically don't have friends in the area. They typically don't have anything to do it at night. And so rather than to go back to some hotel room which is decorated with terrible taste, um, it makes much more sense to have an event in the evening. People, these events were sort of optional. One of them was just a sort of, just where people just hung around and had snacks. Um, but the other two were evenings where people gave lectures. And um, Feynman, this was back in 1979 or so. Uh, maybe it was 1980, back there, probably 1979. Um, Feynman then was, I think, ill, and uh, I think he knew that he had liver cancer. He survived until about 1987 or 88. Um, anyway, uh, so on the evening that um, that there was a sort of I, I don't know what to call it, a kind of just. Um, uh, party of sorts, or I didn't notice any alcohol, I missed it. Anyway, Feynman was sitting there on a couch. And, I mean, I went to the place just looking for Feynman, I was, and I saw him on a couch. I made a beeline for him, and I, I either sat down in front of the couch or sat on a chair nearest the couch and started asking him questions. I asked him one question. Very nice. And I asked him another question. He answered that very nicely. Then I asked him a third question. He answered that very nicely. When I got to my fourth question, he looked at me and said, Give me a break, will you? <laughs> and uh, so I stopped asking questions. Um, with two more interactions or things that I noticed about Feynman there. One was, um, when he gave a lecture, he was talking about core confinement, which of course still theoretically is an open question, much to the embarrassment of the phys physics community. Um, something we don't advertise, but it should be um, in bold letters on the wall of every physics department. We don't understand core Anyway, um, 
finally gave a lecture, and what I noticed was how he was using his hands to illustrate points in the, the lecture. Most people just talk, and I'm like, I think he had a transparent, but this was the days of all the head projectors. I think he had transparencies, but he was just always illustrating with his fingers like that. Another thing was that he came to, of course, the evening lectures, and as it was getting late, he said, um, from the back of the room, I uh, have a car here and I'm driving home. I could give a couple of you guys a lift. So my hand shot up within a nanosecond and um, somebody else also raised his hand. The two of us followed him around and we got into his car, which as I remember was very nondescript. It was totally ordinary. Car. Nothing fancy at all. And, um, so he said, where are you going? And the guy who got into the front said um, where he was going. And I said, where my hotel or motel was. And he said, oh, where's the case? They're in opposite directions. So I said, well, take him home first. <laughs> so we, we drove to that guy's place. And then he finally drove me back. He said, um, what are you working on? And I said, or confinement. So he said, how are you doing? <laughs> and I said, well. And I just gave him sort of some ideas that I thought might lead somewhere, but everything was very nebulous. Anyway, so he dropped me off. Um, let's see, what was, was there any other? Oh yeah, one more final story. Um, this was very brief. I think this was at that conference, but it might have been some other conference that he attended. In any event, I was sitting in, really in the front, almost the front row, possibly the front row, and then one or two rows behind me was finally, and some guy was giving a lecture. And in those days, not only were the overhead, overhead transparencies, but some people had the awful habit of constraining the viewer's attention. So they'd have a blank piece of paper that they put on top of the transparency and they'd slowly pull it down, sort of a strip tease act on the transparency. And so Feynman said, you know, you can pull away the paper, it won't hurt us. And um, fortunately he did. And I made sure that I don't think I ever used it tease approach for giving all the projected lessons, but if it ever occurred to me, I'm sure as hell wasn't going to do it. Um, and I think maybe everybody who heard what Feynman said also learned that it was really stupid to do that. And so they, I guess, stopped. Anyway, one reason why I went through some of this is that some of you may in the future, 5, 10, 20, 30 years from now, be running a conference think about, I mean, don't have people start at 8 in the morning and then drop them dead at 5 in the afternoon. It makes much more sense to start at some reasonable hour in the morning and then have something happening every night because the people just, you know, won't have anything to do in the evening and it's much better to have a, an event. Um, so lectures, um, there are, there are almost always more people who want to give lectures than there are, than there is room for lectures during the day, and so you can have more lectures at night. Um, so that that would make sense. Um, one professor I know who is still he's at a Col Normal in Paris. Uh, Jean Heliopoulos, he's the eye of the gym mechanism. Lasha Heliopoulos and Mayani. Um, anyway, when Heliopoulos runs summer schools or summer lectures, the, the lectures start at 11. Um, and I thought that was much better than 8 or 9. Um, it's that people need sleep. Okay, so let me get any. Uh, so let me get on now with the functional derivatives and along a few minutes with the stories. Are there any questions? That might be a question.
not about the stories, but about the function of the groups. All right. So let's see. We've done. We we just finished this, and I can give an example of this, namely the shortest uh, point on a, the sh shortest path is a straight line. This is kind of um, a simple example, but examples that we want are probably the simple examples. All right, so what's the functional in this case? So let me just write it down. L of y, to change the notation, x0 to x1, square root of dx squared plus dy squared. So what is that? That's the integral x1 to x2, square root of 1 plus y times squared dx. That's the way we normally write it. So that's our functional of y. And now we want to um, find when it's stationary. So let's do variation. Oh, I wrote y. Maybe I should write y of x, actually. So let me, that might be a better notation. So this would be. Um, d by the epsilon L of y plus epsilon h, epsilon equals to zero, at least in general. So this is d by the epsilon integral. Well, actually, it's x zero to x one. Uh, square root of one plus y prime plus epsilon h prime squared dx and so this is integral x0 to x1, y prime h prime over the square root of 1 plus y squared dx. So we're just differentiating with respect to the number epsilon of the parameter epsilon. And now let's just assume that all of our h's vanish at x0 and x1. And so this is minus the integral x0 to x1 uh, h uh, d by dx of y prime over the square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx. And if we want this thing to be stationary, what are we saying? Well, we're saying that uh, or to put it differently, we can say that this thing we can say this is uh, the integral of h y double prime over 1 plus y prime squared dx. So that's what happens if you carry out this differentiation. And um, consequently, y of, say, uh, x would then be, replace this by delta of, um, well, x prime, let us say. Then this would be integral delta x minus x prime, y double prime to the square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx. And so this would be y double prime of x prime over the square root of 1 plus y. And um, so the condition that uh, this be a minimum or be stationary is that this should vanish. Well, if this, is, this should vanish uh, identically, then uh, this is non-negative. In fact, it's positive. So we have to have y double prime equal to 0. So the answer is y double prime is 0. So y is equal to mx plus b. Y is a so that's what you knew. So 
So let me, ooh, we're getting to the end of the hour. I realize that the story would take so much time. All right, let's um, consider second order functional derivatives. So what are we doing now? Well, it's d2 d epsilon squared of g of f plus epsilon h at epsilon equal to zero. So let's consider, say, gn of f, for example, just the functional f to the n of x dx. So what's this second order functional derivative? Well, it's d2, d epsilon squared of gn plus f plus epsilon h, epsilon equal to 0. This is d2, d epsilon squared of an integral of x plus h dn dx. Zero. Well, obviously we want to focus on the epsilon squared term, and so this is d2 d epsilon squared integral the binomial coefficient n over 2 epsilon squared h squared of x f to the n minus 2 of x dx. And I don't really need to say epsilon equals zero anymore. And so what do we get? The answer is n, n minus one, integral f, n minus two, x, h, of x, dx. And so if we said, um, the second variational derivative of gn of y with respect to, let us say, uh, y of x prime, then this would be, this integration with the delta function, so this would be n, n minus 1 integral f to the n minus 2 of x delta x minus y dx, and this is just n, n minus 1, f to the n minus 2 of y. So this, so in other words, in physics notation, the second variational derivative is n, n minus 1, f to the n minus 2 of y, if this is the functional. Any questions? Consider this particular case and let's do the second order derivative S0 of Q and H d2 d epsilon squared integral dt m over 2 q dot plus epsilon h dot squared again plus epsilon equals 0. And what do we get? What we get is integral t1 t2 dt m h dot squared. And this is greater than or equal to 0. So without even going to the physics limit of uh, h being delta t minus t prime, what we see is that the second variational derivative of this uh, free action of a particle in one dimension 
is always positive, that means the classical solution is a minimum. It's not just stationary, but it's a minimum. Because the second variation derivative is positive. Now, it's not always true that, um, uh, that, the, that, that when, if we have, what, what do they call it, Q. So this is the equation that gives you the classical equation of motion in general. Well, let's just say S, where this is this minus V, say, in general. So you don't know, in general, whether You don't know whether that's positive or negative in general. And when it's positive or non-negative, then the classical solution is a minimum. But sometimes the classical solution isn't a minimum. And in these, these are some of the cases in which, or which chaos ar uh, arises. Chaos is typically associated with um, Stationary solutions that are not uh, minima. And um, why is it associated with a stationary solution? Well, because we're talking about classical chaos, so obviously it would be a stationary solution. And why would it be chaotic? Well, if this thing, if it isn't a minimum, then if you deviate a little bit from that stationary solution, uh, at first it doesn't change at all. Uh, it, it, it doesn't change the first order, but it does change the second order. And if the if the um, action goes down, then the tendency for the paths to diverge. So that's why the chaos occurs. All right. Well, um, I'm going to continue. I'm going to finish this um, section, this chapter on functional derivatives, and then uh, go back to the path integrals on Monday. And um, uh, in particular, I'll go to do the path integrals in Minkowski space, also do the path integral for a vector field, and show the charges, uh, opposite charges track, and um, and uh, do the Feynman propagator in the Minkowski space. And um, well, that'll take up all day, possibly two, possibly one day. And I'll have to think of some homework problems. So I, I try, I'll try this time to make them nice and All right, I guess we can stop. Any questions?